Today we're going to talk about auditory scene analysis, by which I refer to the process of inferring events in the world from sound. And just to give you a sense of what I mean by this, I'm just going to play you a little clip that I recorded on my phone. Just listen to this. All right, so I don't know how easy that was to understand in this church, but the point of playing you this is just to point out that your brain infers an awful lot about what happens in the world from sound. Um, so that was just an, the, the kind of thing that enters your ears on an everyday basis. You could probably tell that was a recording from a sports bar, and just by listening to that, you could probably recognize the voices of a few people who were in the bar. You could probably tell they were watching football. Um, you could hear people clapping. You could probably also hear the voice of the announcer, and you could probably tell that was different from the voices of the people that were in the bar. You could probably also then hear the crowd noise that was being piped in over the TV. Right? So you're, you're inferring all that stuff about what was going on in the world from a, a sensory input that the first order just looks like this. So there were these sound waves traveling through the air, and they make your eardrums wiggle back and forth. Um, and so the interesting problem here like in, in many cases in perception, is that most of the world events that you care about as a listener are not explicit in the waveform, in the sense that if I, I give you the waveform and let you look at it or give it to you in digital form and let you run some simple classifier on it, you're going to have a hard time telling me what's there. So the, the auditory scene analysis problem that is most commonly studied that many of you may have encountered uh, previously is what's known as the cocktail party problem. And this refers to the fact that in a lot of situations in the real world, your ear receives a mixture of, of more than one source. So this would be one example. Release soon. All right, Debbie Whitaker, Sterling James, wrapping things up. All right, so that's just a little clip from the radio. And so the point is that there are two sources there in some sense. There's this person talking, and then there's the music that's there in the background. Um, and so what enters your ear is the mixture of those two sources. And of course, as a listener, you're not particularly interested in the mixture per se. You're usually interested in individual sources. You want to understand what the person said or maybe recognize whether that, that's your favorite song or, or whatnot. And so this problem of taking that mixture as, as sensory but in inferring the structure of one or more of the sources is a classic example of the kind of thing in perception that we call an ill-posed problem. And it's ill-posed because there are many sets of possible sounds that add up to equal the observed mixture. So this red signal here is what is entering your ears. It's generated by these two blue signals, which are the things that occurred in the world. And the problem is that there are lots and lots and lots of these pairs of green signals, which are distinct from the ones that occurred in the world, but that also sum up to be equal to that mixture that you observe. And so somehow your brain has to choose the correct set of sources, the blue ones, over all the other possibilities. So how on earth do we manage to hear? Well, as is usually the case with ill-posed problems, you can only solve them by making assumptions about the natures of, of the things that you're trying to inf infer. And you can only make assumptions about sources if real-world sound sources have some degree of regularity. Um, but fortunately, it, it, it's the case that real-world sounds are not random, and one way to note this is just by listening to some of them. So here's some real-world sounds. So we can compare those to samples from a random process. And so these, these are just waveforms where every sample in the waveform is generated from some IID distribution. So we get samples of white noise. So here's one. Here's another. Here's another. And it's pretty clear that we'd have to sit here for a long time generating these random samples before you got something that sounded like a doorbell or a hawk or a, or a horse. All right, and so the point here is that real world sounds are a very, 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 very small portion of the set of all possible sounds. They exhibit very tight statistical regularities. And we believe that we rely on these regularities in order to be able to hear. All right, without them, we wouldn't be able to solve this, this problem. So today's topic uh, is a second scene analysis problem that has some conceptual similarities to the, the cocktail party problem, but which is relatively neglected. And it's due to the fact that in real world settings like this one, sound sources interact with the environment on the way to your ear. Um, and so this interaction is known as reverberation, and it's depicted in this picture here. So here in, in this diagram, we've got a guy sitting in a room, and there's a speaker that is emitting sound. Okay? So the sound travels directly from the speaker to the listener's ears. Those are those gray lines here. But the sound scatters all over the place, and so it reaches the listener's ears via many other paths as well. And so the blue lines depict the paths that involve a single reflection off of walls in the room, and the red lines involve the paths that involve two reflections 
And of course, there's many paths that involve three and four and five and six reflections as well. They're just not depicted on here in order to make the diagram intelligible. So the collective effect of all these reflections is what's known as reverberation. And because the path lengths of these paths that involve reflections are longer, they involve effectively delayed copies that, that get sent to your ears that overlap with the direct copy. So if the speaker's broadcasting speech, for instance, you might get this blue waveform that's coming directly from the speaker, and then a little bit later, one of the reflections will arrive, and then a little bit later, another one will arrive, and a little bit later, and so on and so forth. And all these things just add together. Okay. So this is something that happens all the time. Um, but it's been relatively neglected in, in the study of human hearing, and that fact is kind of nicely summarized by this picture here, which is taken from a psychoacoustic study back in, in the 30s. And so this is a study where they were trying to look at sound localization. They explicitly wanted to eliminate the effects of rever reverberation, and so they put the subject, which is this gentleman here in a suit, up on top of the roof of this particular building. And so this is a direct quote from the paper. So they say, in order to avoid possible reflecting surfaces, a tall swivel chair was erected on top of a ventilator which rises nine feet above the roof of the new biological laboratories at Harvard University. At the present time, this procedure appears to be the only practicable means of avoiding errors due to the reflection of sound. So this is Stevens and Newman, 1936. So this is um, S.S. Stevens of Stevens Law fame. Those of you who are who know psychophysics will, will know about that. Um, and I, I show this because I think it very nicely makes two points. One is the, the fact that, that people have kind of often gone out of their way to eliminate the effects of reflections when studying hearing. Um, and second, that, that this process of reverberation is ubiquitous in the sense that if you want to get rid of it, you have to put somebody up on top of a building in order to get rid of all of the reflecting surfaces, right? All right, so reverberation is ubiquitous, and I'm going to argue that it poses a major challenge for the brain. Um, so one way to see this is just to look at sound signals with and without reverberation. So what I've got here is a version of a spectrogram of a recording of, of speech that's made in what we call dry conditions. So you put a microphone close to a person, you, you mic them up in a, a small room that doesn't have very reflective surfaces, and you get something that looks like this. So this is a plot of frequency content over time. And the point is just that the speech is very highly structured, and we think that you use that structure to understand what, what people are saying. And below it, I've got the same kind of diagram for speech in reverberant conditions. And what you can see is that this looks very, very different, right? It's profoundly distorted relative to the original signal. So I can play you what these things sound like. I should note that this is an unusually reverberant space, right? Um, one of the more reverberant spaces that I've spoken in. And so a lot of the demos I'm going to play here are going to have the <laughs> compounded effects of whatever I did plus the rever reverb in the room. But this is dry speech. They ate the lemon pie. Father forgot the bread. And even in this, this room, you could probably hear this has got more reverb. They ate the lemon pie. Father forgot the bread. All right, so it's profoundly distorted. But the remarkable thing is that you're sitting here listening to me, and you can basically understand what I'm saying, and you could probably understand that speech signal as well. Right? So humans are really remarkably robust to this very pronounced type of distortion. But, but it's a big challenge for automatic speech recognition. This is a graph that shows the performance of, from a few years ago, from five state-of-the-art speech recognition algorithms. So the y-axis is plotting percent errors, um, and then you have the, the, the performance of the five algorithms in three different conditions. So zero is where there's no reverberations. That's dry, and you can see there's almost no errors, and that's consistent with the fact that automatic speech recognition nowadays in quiet conditions works really, really well. But you can see that as you add just a, a modest amount of reverberation, 300 or 500 milliseconds, the errors jump way, way up. Right? And I should say that th this is quite modest. So in this room, my estimate is that you probably have about 1,500 milliseconds of reverb. Um, so this is kind of what you would get in like a small classroom on this graph. So it it's ama it's, remains a major technological challenge as well. Now, on the other hand, Reverberation also provides us with a lot of information uh, about the environment. So it's one of the main auditory cues to the size of the room that we're in. So you can tell from listening to me that we're in a pretty good sized room. You can imagine that if all of the walls were a lot closer to the listener, the path lengths would be shorter and so the reflections would arrive uh, sooner in time. And because of this, it's, it's one of the most commonly used tricks in music production. So for instance, I'll put different kinds of reverb on the background vocals from the foreground vocals to make them sound more distinct. Now to measure reverb in a standardized way, we, we record something called the impulse response. That's really exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's the response of a space to an impulse. So an, an impulse is just a, is what it sounds like. It's an impulsive source. 
like you would get if you fired a gun. So you fire a gun in a space like this, and you have a microphone that's recording the signal. Well, what'll happen is you'll get the direct sound. Those, remember, those are those green lines here. So that'll give you an immediate impulse. And then you'll get each of the reflections that comes in with some delay. You can see that the amplitude of the reflections are attenuated, and that's because the surfaces in the room will absorb some of the energy from that impulse. Uh, and you get this particular pattern that'll be characteristic of, of the space. So here's an actual impulse response that's recorded in a classroom. So it's just, you can plot it as a sound waveform. So this is pressure as a function of time. And so you get this initial peak that is the direct sound. And so the delay here is just related to how far away the sound source is from your microphone. But then you get all these other peaks that are these early reflections. And then they kind of blend together. And you get this tail that kind of decays away with time. So you can listen to it. And it sounds like a tap that was made in a room, more or less. Okay. So here's the situation. So there'll be some sound source in the world that is making noise. That's S of T. There's an environmental impulse response that's characteristic of the space. That's this filter F of T. And those two things get convolved. So they're combined via an operation known as convolution, and that yields the sound that enters your ears, which is R of T. And so the sound that you are receiving always combines the effect of reverberation with that of a, of a sound source. And so the problem, very much akin to the cocktail party problem, is that this combined signal is typically not of particular interest to you. You might be interested in what the source is saying. You might also be interested in what the environment is like. But you get this combination that mixes their effects together. So the key question that we've been trying to investigate is whether we can view the perception of reverberation as a process of separating the properties of the sound source from the properties of the reverberation. So some reason to think this is not a crazy idea is that, as I mentioned, humans can recognize sounds quite well despite reverberation. We're, we're really remarkably robust. And we can also derive some information from reverb about the nature of the environment. The problem, of course, is that the inference of the source and or the reverberation is another example of an ill-posed problem, very much akin to the cocktail party problem. So you observe this signal R of T. It's the, the result of these two unknown signals that uh, are, are a function of the state of the world. So you've got one equation and two unknowns. And as with the cocktail party problem, it's not solvable without assumptions about the, the source and the filter. So our approach to, to studying this problem was to note that any assumptions that the brain is making about reverberation are likely related to acoustic regularities of the world. Um, and so we first sought out to actually establish whether there were any such regularities that the brain might have internalized. And although there had been lots of anecdotal measurements of, of room impulse responses, they'd never been characterized in any kind of systematic way. So we first sought to measure reverb in real world conditions and to, and to characterize its regularities. So this talk describes the work of a postdoc in my lab named James Treyer. So James was trained as a mathematical physics. He did his PhD in ocean acoustics. Um, and then uh, since coming to my lab, he's been studying uh, the perceptual effects of reverberation. All right, so the first question we're going to try to answer is, what is the empirical distribution of environmental impulse responses? And so in order to do this, we need to make lots of impulse response measurements. And so the, the technique, and in particular, we want to do this in the kinds of spaces that people occupy in their lives. And so the technique that I described of firing a gun is not going to work very well in a restaurant or, or a bar. All right, so we used an alternative method. So here's the apparatus that we use. So there's a speaker that broadcasts a fixed known source signal, and then a recorder which records what that source signal sounds like in some particular space. So here they're set up in an elevator in Building 46 uh, at MIT. And because we know what the source signal is, it's a, a low amplitude noise signal, and because we have the, the recording of what it sounds like in the space, we can, from those two signals, infer what the impulse response of the particular space is. All right, and, and the noise signal uh, extends for quite a while in time. And so as a consequence, you can effectively average out background noise. So you can take this to a, a restaurant or a bar or a public space, and you can make a recording and actually measure the impulse response. All right, so what we were attempting to do is to basically draw samples from the distribution of reverberation that people encounter in their lives. And so to do this, we enrolled a bunch of participants in an impulse response survey. So the volunteers in the survey were sent 24 text messages a day at random times. 
and their phone was programmed to return their uh, GPS coordinates whenever it got one of our texts. And in addition, the participants were supposed to take a photograph of wherever they were and, and send it to us, and then also send us the address. And so from those three pieces of information, we could usually figure out where they were, and then James would go to the space, set up the apparatus, and measure the impulse response. So we did this with seven people, each of them did this for a couple weeks, and so we got about 300 locations. And so to our knowledge, this is by far the largest set of these measurements that, that have been made. And in particular, they're not made in, in, in spaces like churches, they're just made in the everyday kinds of spaces that people encounter in their lives. And so we've got recordings from restaurants, department stores, city streets, the woods, bathrooms, subway stations, and all kinds of other everyday spaces. So the key question is, does this set of measurements exhibit regularities? And so to look at this, uh, we, we take the impulse responses and we try to examine them in a way that's kind of relevant to the brain. So we, we process them with a bank of filters that simulates the ear's analysis of sounds. So this is a bank of filters that mimic the frequency tuning that you see in the cochlea. And we can then take the impulse response and represent it as what we call a cochleogram. So that's just a representation of frequency content over time. And so you can look at the cochleogram like a picture, as you, as you would here, um, or you can just look at the energy content of a, a few different frequency channels over time. And so that's what I'm showing you here is the energy response in four different frequency channels, the ones that are shown in red here, for an impulse response recorded in an office, and then one from the Park Street T station. It's a subway station in, in Boston. And when we look at them in this way, um, we, we see that there are, are, are pretty consistent regularities in uh, the way that energy decays with time. So what's plotted on the y-axis is power and on the x-axis is time. And so you can see that the power decays with time. And you can also see that it decays in a way that's pretty linear. So this is a logarithmic scale. And so the fact that we can fit these things pretty well with straight lines until we hit the noise floor, which is shown in red, indicates that we're seeing exponential decay. And we basically see this in, in pretty much every example. So the energy always decays exponentially. And we, we can quantify this by fitting polynomials to these things and show that, you, that the best you can do is with that first linear term. The additional terms don't really help you. All right, so we, so we consistently see exponential decay. We can also then look at the decay rate. So those are like the slopes of these lines. And so that's what's plotted here for these two examples. So again, the y-axis is showing frequency and the x-axis show, is showing the decay time. And when you look at impulse responses in this way, you again see some, some consistency. So there's some variation from room to room, but you always see that the high frequencies tend to decay a lot faster than the low frequencies. So these are the, the results across all of the impulse responses that we measured. And the easiest thing to do here is just look at the lines, which are like the medians of, of quartiles. And you see this very systematic pattern where, again, at the mid and low frequencies, the decay is long, and at the high frequencies, it's, it's short. And we believe this is just a function of the absorptive properties of typical materials in the world, as well as probably the, the air. But it's a very systematic regularity. Interestingly, this pattern, it's, it's pretty similar for indoor and outdoor impulse responses. So this is the, the impulse responses grouped into the ones that were made indoors, the ones that were made outdoor in urban settings, like, like cities and towns, and then ones that were made in rural settings where there's no man-made structures. And you can see that this kind of sideways U-shape holds up in all these different cases. Um, so we think the consistency here raises the possibility that this is something that has been internalized by the brain, either maybe you learn it over development, maybe it's something that, that was built in over evolution, and that you might be, be using in order to do auditory scene analysis. All right, so the conclusion here is that environmental impulse responses, despite the diversity of the spaces that we measured, are, are fairly stereotyped. So we find that energy always decays exponentially, and it does so faster at high frequencies than the mids. So this raises the possibility that listeners could employ fairly strong assumptions about reverberation. And so we're going to try to test whether they've done so by synthesizing impulse responses that either mimic real-world reverberation, according to these properties, or that deviate it from it in, in various ways. And so an initial simple test is just to listen to the impulse response itself. And so the idea is that if your brain interprets the impulse response as reverberation, the impulse response ought to sound like an impulse that you hear in a space. And so I played you that classroom impulse response a while ago. Here's just some other examples. So this is the inside of a car. Here's another classroom, a forest. This is the BCS atrium. All right, so in this room, they all kind of sound the same, but the point is they sound like impulses in, in spaces. 
All right, so we're going to synthesize impulse responses but just by taking a, a white noise signal, splitting it up into different frequency bands, imposing different kinds of decay. In this case, this is exponential decay with different decay rates, and then adding them up to get a synthetic impulse response. So we can then listen to it. All right, and so the cool thing is that even though this is just noise that has different decay rates imposed on it, when we impose exponential decay that has, has decay rates that more or less mimic what you find in the world, you get this thing that sounds like an impulse in a space. And what's really remarkable is that when you violate these regularities, uh, you get something that doesn't sound like that at all. So I'm going to play you this example here where in, instead of mimicking the decay rates that we see in the real world where the high frequencies decay fast and the mids decay slow, we're going to reverse that. So in this example, the high frequencies will decay a lot more slowly than the mids. All right? And instead of sounding like reverberation, you're going to hear this high frequency hiss. It's almost like you opened a soda can or something, right? So I think this is really cool because th there's some sense in which these two things are kind of the same thing, right? They're just noise that has exponential decay imposed on it with different decay constants. But in one case, your brain is content to interpret that as reverberation, and in the other case, you're, you're really not. And we think that that is some evidence that, that you've internalized these regularities that are present in the real world. Okay, so these results are consistent with the idea that listeners have internalized the properties of naturally occurring reverberation. And so the, the key question that we then wanted to ask is whether listeners can separate the source <clears throat> and the environmental filter given assumptions of, about these impulse response properties. And so the key prediction is that extraction of source properties ought to be better if the impulse response conforms to the real world distribution. All right, so we did an experiment to try to measure this. So in this experiment, on every trial, people hear three sounds. So each of the sounds is the convolution of a source signal with an impulse response. Now, two of the sources are the same, and one of them is different, but all three of the impulse responses are different. So as a consequence, all three of the sounds are different from each other, right? but two of them were generated from the same source. And so we're asking listeners if they can hear that by telling us which source is different from the other two. So here's just an example of what it sounds like. So these are synthetic sources, so they don't necessarily sound like anything real. All right, so you could probably hear there the first one was different from the, from the other two. All right. Okay, so here are the results of this experiment. So the y-axis is plotting proportion correct, and the x-axis is showing you the results from different kinds of of uh, impulse response conditions. The first bar is just showing what people are doing in dry conditions when there's no reverb and they're getting about 85% correct. Um, that's because the task is hard. We, we wanted them to be below ceiling. So the next bar is showing what happens if the reverb mimics the properties of real world reverberation. We call that ecological. And so you can see that people are a little bit worse but they're still well above chance. So the key question is what's going to happen if we give them the exact same task but with an impulse response that violates the regularities that we see in the world in, in various respects. And that's what each of these four bars here um, are. And so if, if people are really relying on knowledge of real world regularities in order to, to do some kind of separation, we would expect them to be worse. And in fact, that's what we observe. So in all of these cases, um, people are significantly worse than they are when the reverberation mimics what you, what you see in the world. Okay. All right. So finally, we, we asked whether listeners can conversely estimate the properties of the environment from the reverberant signal. So we gave them sort of like the reverse task. So they event, again heard three sounds on every trial. Again, each sound is the convolution of a source with an impulse response. But here, all three sources are different and two of the impulse responses are the, are the same and the other one's different. And so now people have to answer the question, which room was different from the other two? All right, so again, all three signals are distinct from, from each other, but two of them were generated from the same room. Okay. And so again, the, the, the notion is that if, if people can do this separation relying on their knowledge of real world regularities, then they, they would be better at this task if for impulse responses that conform to the properties of real world reverb. Okay, so this is what happens if you give people ecological reverb. So it's a hard task, but they're well above chance. And when we, we give them the exact same task, but with reverberation that violates these properties in various respects, we, we see that they're substantially worse. Right? So they're, they have a much harder time pulling out the properties of the impulse response uh, when, it, when it violates these regularities. Okay, so just to summarize what, what I've told you, um, I've argued that the core problems of audition are ill-posed scene analysis problems. 
and they require the brain to use prior knowledge of statistical regularities of, of real world sounds. Um, and I'm, I'm arguing that we should think of the perception of reverberation as, as this type of problem. So we measured the distribution of environmental impulse responses and despite the diversity of the kinds of spaces that people encounter in their lives, we find that the impulse responses are pretty highly constrained, presumably due to the consistency of the kind of stuff that the world is, is made of. So they always exhibit exponential decay that has this particular frequency dependence where high frequencies de decay a lot more quickly than, than uh, low. And we found that people's ability to discriminate sound sources and impulse responses is better for impulse responses that are faithful to the empirical distribution that we observe in, in the world. And so we think this is suggestive of a separation process that uses fairly strong assumptions about the nature of, of reverberation. These are potentially learned from experience or maybe even built into the, to the auditory system. So I just want to uh, conclude by again acknowledging um, James Traer, who, who did most of the work, some of the other people that helped us with this, and thank you all for your attention.